Hey guys, it's Q&A Tuesday. So I am going to do something different today. Today I'm going to discuss SIHH. Now, numerous questions on my YouTube in regards to new models coming out from SIHH. Uh, probably the number one question was about the 1159 model from Audemars Piguet. Uh, let's see, Buquet, David B, Kuba Carters, Hallmark Creates, Jack Black, Jake Roth, Seven Ram, McKinley Stevens, Terry C, SG Comedy, and so on and so forth. All of you guys have asked me questions or opinion on SIHH one way or the other. Some questions were more general, some were more specific to a watch or a brand. You all want to know what I think about SIHH releases. I'm dying to tell you guys what I think about the SIHH releases, specifically, obviously, my favorite Audemars Piguet, which is the one I'm going to start with today. Uh, so lo and behold, I'm simply going to go on to AudemarsPiguet.com and I'm going to pull up their new model list. And you guys can actually follow along. If you go to AudemarsPiguet.com and you click on new, which is right at the top, and click the, the link that says discover our novelties. So the very first thing you're going to see on the new on the novelties on AP on AutomarPK.com is the code 1159, which they did a big thing about releasing on their website. I think there was a countdown for a few days until they actually revealed the watch at SIHH. You have your plain Jane automatics, you have the chronographs, uh, you have the perpetual calendar, you have the mini repeater Super Sonnery, which is a ridiculous watch, by the way. Uh, you have the self winding flying tourbillon, and you also have the tourbillon open work, which is probably the most gorgeous looking one of them all. But uh, and then you have all the new Royal Oak editions, the Royal Oak Offshore, and the hot jewelry, hot jewelry, hot jewelry. That one, okay, crazy looking watch. Anyway. Uh, I'm going to start with the Royal Oaks and I'm going to quickly run through them. And the first one I'm going to start with is the Frosted Gold Double Balance Wheel Open Work. Double Balance Wheel Open Work 41 millimeter, arguably one of the most collectible Audemars Piguets out there in stainless steel. Last year they came out with the Frosted Gold finishes, right? They did it in a 41 millimeter for men, they did it in a 37 and a 33 millimeter for ladies in both white gold and rose gold. It's sort of that sparkly finish as they called it and uh, it's not diamonds but yet it shines like a fully iced out watch. Uh, not very cheap, but nevertheless was a hit. The 41 millimeter at this point is impossible to find. I had them all, 41, 37, and 33. And I think I'm down to 133 millimeter because that was the worst selling one because it's the smallest one. And it's strictly a ladies watch where a 37 mm can go both ways and a 41 mm men can wear as well. And ladies do too if they like big watches. So what did they do? They took the best of both worlds. They took the Frosted, which was popular last year. They did well with it. And they took the Royal Oak Open Work. Balance, double balance wheel, which is arguably the most popular stainless steel pair. They combined the two, and voila, and they gave you a new collectible, and I think that's what it's going to be. That's going to be a coveted piece. And, of course, they took it to the next level by taking the very next watch, which is the Royal Oak Double Balance Wheel Open Work with a baguette diamond bezel. And why do you do that? Again, how many of these are going to make? Probably very, very few. It's price upon request on the website. If I had to guess, this watch is going to trade way over 100,000. They're probably going to make a very few. And this is for somebody that kind of likes bling but will not go aftermarket because a lot of these open work uh, guys on 47th Street, I know they iced them all out. And they look pretty kick-ass iced out. So listen, why should Audemars Piguet skip out on all the fun on icing watches? Oh, they did it on their own and they put a factory baguette bezel on there and they're going to charge through the roof for it. And guess what? They will still sell. Next, let's talk about the new 15500 Royal Oaks. Again, 15400s last year and the years before, arguably the most collectible pieces. Rose gold on a strap, rose gold on a brace, a white dial, black dial, stainless steel, the white, the blue, the black, all trading over list. Everybody loves them. This is sort of that Nautilus from Audemars Piguet right now. Again, both gentle designs, don't forget. Uh, and what do you do? You leave while you're hot. Obviously with the introductions of 15500s, the 15400s are going to go away and the prices are going to climb even further and it's going to help the sales of the 15500s. What's the difference in the watches? Slight variations in that as well as a new caliber 4302 with a bigger power reserves. Other than that, pretty much the same watch. Now, uh, let's look at the dial combinations. They did the blue, they did the gray, they did the black, right? Uh, I'm assuming somewhere in there there will be a white dial introduced later on, but uh, as of right now they're not showing one, but I'm fairly certain the white dial will come out at a later time once these sell out. Is it going to change anything in the realm of plain Royal Oaks? Absolutely not. These things are going to sell and they're going to sell like hotcakes, specifically the blue dial, which is usually the most collectible and reserved for boutiques. Retail price $19,200, higher that of a $15,400. Nevertheless, expect to pay over retail for those pieces in pretty much any dial combination. 
so what else is left in a 41 millimeter category? They made a frosted Royal Oak chronograph wife. Now all the frosted models, I don't know if I mentioned, they're all gold. They're, they don't make them in steel and rightfully so. You can, I don't think you can get that finish in a stainless steel watch. So they made a purple monster, as I like to call it, the 2631BC. It's a frosted chronograph with a purple dial. Hmm. Yeah, I'm not sure about this one. And, and here's the thing. If you wanted to take that frosted line to the next level, I don't necessarily think I would jump right to a bright purple dial. Because a bright purple dial is very specific. And on one hand, you're making something completely different. You know that's what it is. If somebody's wearing a Royal Oak and you see that purple dial, you're gonna know that it's a frosted 41 millimeter Royal Oak chrono. At the same token, I probably would have toned that down. The frosted watches look great with that silver dial. Uh, the Plain Jane Frosted they came out with last year, they look really, really great with a gray dial. And I feel like they should have done just that. Again, I'm not really feeling the purple dial. Uh, it's, a, it's a bit much. The frosted finish is a bit much to begin with. The retail price of 63.3, mm, yeah. You're gonna get that watch at a discount if this is something that you really, really want, unless they make a very limited amount of them and you're only gonna be a boutique edition, whatever it might be, and that's gonna to wanna to make somebody have it more, and then the prices should be able to stay up. And last but not least in the 41 millimeter is the Royal Oak Turbion Extra Thin. Uh, price upon request, again, my guess is gonna be upwards of 200,000. It was a limited edition of 100 pieces. This is another variation of the Extra Thin Turbion that they came out with in the past. They did it in stainless steel, they did it in rose, they did it variations of different baguette bezels, whether it was sapphires or diamonds. They did it in a multitude of dials. They had blue dials, they had a purple dial on that watch, white dial, black dial, rose dial. Uh, it was a limited edition, I think, as well. What do you do? Remember the Ceramic Perpetual that's now still trading at about $50,000 over its original retail price? I think the retail was $83,000 and they're still trading that 135 mark. So now, let's take it to the next level. If the market can sustain paying a 50,000 over list for ceramic perpetual, let's make a ceramic turbine. And this is exactly what they did. And guess what? That watch will sell like hotcakes just the same. I'm not sure about it going over retail. I don't know what the current list price on this watch would be. I would imagine it would be fairly up there. And when you get into a piece uh, that already retails for so high, it's kind of tough to trade them over list unless, again, it's 100 pieces made. How many are gonna be at the boutiques? How many are gonna be given to dealers? If they all stay at the boutiques, they may very well trade over list, especially if they produce them over the next few years, because you do understand they're not gonna come out with all 100 pieces at once, because that would just be stupid. Let's quickly talk about something that's not a surprise to me, the 15202 BC, which is the ultra thin Royal Oak. 15202 stainless steel, super high collectible, rose gold, super high collectible. Why not come out with a variation of it in white gold with a salmon dial? I like the salmon dial. Some may not call it a salmon dial, this is what I call it, or some call it light orange dial, whatever, to each his own. Bottom line is, it's a 15202, it's an ultra thin, it's the ultimate collectible for MP, the stainless steel pieces are through the roof right now. They're priced at a 55 some thousand dollars, which is a little bit hefty, but they will still sell because it's a 15202. They could have made that purple, they could have made it hot pink, it doesn't matter, a 15202, whatever metal it might be, is highly coveted by collectors. This watch will be sold out and it will be sold out quickly. Moving on to the first controversial thing that Audemars Piguet did, and that is taking the chronographs and making them into 38 millimeters. They came out with a panda, white and blue dial, beautiful combination. They came out with a slate gray and a light gray dial, another beautiful combination. Uh, and then they did the rose gold with, with the white dial with rose sub dials. Now you do understand that this is what they introduced. Throughout the next few years, you're gonna see different color combinations. All of these, as you've seen with the previous Rolex and 41 and M. Was it a good move to scale down to 38 mm? If you think about it, in general, anybody that is out there owning these Royal Oaks and that says I love big watches, including myself, will, will always, always admit that at the end of the day, these watches are still a bit too big on us, right? For example, I'm wearing the Barrichello right now, right? It's a 42 millimeter offshore that wears like a 44 millimeter. And look, it looks good on the wrist, but it's still big on me. You can tell that it's big on me. And I have an average size wrist, maybe a little bit smaller. An average person out there, a 41 millimeter Royal Oak, even a 39 millimeter Royal Oak, because of the lug system and everything else is still a bit big on them. Is that the reason AP did this? I have no idea. I don't, you know, I don't sit in the design boards. I don't, I don't take part in the design process. I wish I did. I could certainly give them a lot of pointers, but uh, uh, nevertheless, a 38 millimeter chronograph is now a true, true unisex watch. Got girls out there wearing Daytonas. You got girls out there wearing these uh, even 41 millimeter Royal Oaks, 39 millimeter Royal Oaks. Uh, my wife for a while wore a 39 millimeter Royal Oak Chrono. Uh, and she also had a 15300, which is 39 millimeters. And she loved it. 
Sometimes she'll throw on the, the my 39 millimeter A series that I've shown you guys in previous episodes. She likes that big bulky look. Now here's the watch that can truly be an option for a female and a male just the same, where you cannot pinpoint whether this is a men's watch or a lady's watch. One of the smart things that they did is they came out with color combinations that didn't exist in previous Royal Oaks. Now let's say this thing flopped completely. They didn't really lose a whole lot. There's no official announcement of the discontinuation of the 41 mm's. And they only came out with three models. And guess what? These three models will sell like hotcakes. They'll come out with the next three models and the next three models. And for the next few years, we're going to see the reign of the 38 millimeter Royal Oak chronograph. Non-chronos will follow, trust me, I know. Not because Francois called me and told me so, but it's only logical that this will happen. If I'm a collector of plain Royal Oaks, I have the A serial Royal Oak, right? Potentially, I want to have the A, B, the B, and the C serial Royal Oaks. Then I'm going to have it in two-tone. Then I'm going to have the 15300. Then I'm going to have the 15400 and have a different color dial and every different size combination. For, for true diehard Royal Oak collectors, they're going to want to have that Royal Oak in every different size. And these things will sell. Oh, for one, like I said, it's an awesome looking watch. So it's not a flop in my opinion. They will sell. And if you want one, I suggest you get in line now because you're going to have a tough time picking one up. Last but not least, I'm gonna talk about what they did for the ladies, and that is the frosted 37 millimeter double balance open work. Again, more of what I said earlier, take the double balance watch and you know show some love for the ladies. This is truly a ladies watch. And it's got a rainbow bezel, surprise, surprise. I've told you guys this before, all these companies, they all copy off of each other. Ever since the Rolex came out with the Rainbow Daytona, you've seen a slew of watches that look just like it, whether it was from Chopard, whether it was from Jacob & Co., and a slew of other companies. They all want to make the Rainbow Bezel. Hopefully, this is something that's going to create the same type of hype as a Rolex Daytona Rainbow did, which it won't. But nevertheless, it's a pretty good-looking watch, I'll tell you. And why is it a pretty good-looking watch? The Royal Oak in itself is a very rugged watch. Uh, to begin with, it's a very sporty watch. You start to dress it up with the frosted and the rainbow bezel and everything else and the skeleton and throw that skeleton into the mix, I think sometimes it becomes a bit too much. And if I had to guess the price of this watch, it's going to be upwards to $100,000. It says price upon request on the website. It's going to be an expensive watch. They won't make very many of them. And most likely this will be a watch that a guy will prefer to buy for his, for, let's say, for his wife, girlfriend, or whomever. And the reason for that is because guys get all hyped up about the mechanics of this. Oh, it's an open work. Oh, it's a frosted. Oh, it's, it's a rainbow. All the combinations of collectible watches out there, this has got to be the watch I want to have my wife wear, for example. I'm not so sure if you ask 10 ladies uh, how many of them would actually say that that watch is attractive. Perhaps my female viewers would like to comment below and let me know what you think of that particular watch. To me, it's uh, mixed emotions. I'm not so sure that that's a pretty watch. What is a pretty watch is the 33mm quartz Royal Oaks that they did, and all it is is 33mm Royal Oak quartz dressed up in diamonds, which they've made them before in a slightly different combination, so straps, different diamond settings, and so on and so forth. This is Autumn Arts Big way to actually make some money, because you make a lot of money when you dress up watches with diamonds. They charge so much per carat that I don't think even Bank Leaf and our pals charges that much per carat. But for somebody that wants a iced out watch, Everybody sees stainless steel Royal Oaks, 33 mm, 37 mm, which is why they're virtually impossible to find because they get iced out uh, for a fraction of a cost of that of a factory. But a lot of guys out there, myself included, would only go with factory diamond set watches. And this is AP's opportunity to, a, to make money and bring the client a factory iced out watch in a 33 millimeter. I think they will do well with those as well. Lo and behold, moving on to the Royal Oak offshore line. What do we have there? Not a whole lot of new. Three men's pieces, one lady's piece. Not a whole lot of changes, ceramic bezels, ceramic buttons, but it's what kind of ceramic is it? And boy, did it do a great job. You guys remember the camo piece that came out. It was trading at over list for quite a while. Um, it had the green ceramic bezel and uh, it took off. It was, it was trading over list and right now you'd be hard pressed to pick that watch up less than, I don't know, 5% off list, right? When they first came out, the first one, I, the list on it was 31.3. Uh, I sold the very first few for 38,000. I paid 36 and I sold them for 38. And today, and today they're trading still at that retail price mark, not any less. So they do a special edition model that takes off. Everybody loves it. Let's jump on a bandwagon. Let's make a few more, but with some thought process going into it. So they made three new, I'll call them, I guess, camo models because of the straps. Now, I'm gonna talk about the straps uh, first. Uh, they're very reminiscent of a company called Aura Straps, right? I think I even have some. In my desk, I do. Look at that. This is an aura strap. Remind you of something? Absolutely. If you guys don't think for a minute that companies don't pay attention to what quote unquote aftermarket accessory companies do out there, they absolutely do. 
So if, if a company like Audemars Piguet sees that a company like Aura Strap, which does straps for Richard Mills, that does, they do strap for APs, and they're not doing anything wrong, they're just selling you aftermarket accessories for your watch, much like you would buy for your car. But if they see stuff like this, and they see stuff like this is popular, and the easiest way to do it is go on social media. Look up the hashtag Aura Straps. You'll see so many APs out there with these different variations of straps. Hey, why not do our own? Obviously it works, the market likes it, let's introduce it as an original part, and that's exactly what they did with the straps on these watch. Of course, every strap watch matches the green, the blue, and the brown. And honestly, my most impressive thing about these things is the ceramic bezels. Should I say they're trying to do what Richard Mille is doing, where they're doing the different color cases with different color NTPTs? No, AP is doing what AP is doing. And by coming out with a green watch, a blue watch, and a brown watch, and matching the ceramic bezels and the dials and the straps to them, I think they did a wonderful thing. Overall, aesthetically, I give them an A plus on every single one of these watches. Again, uh, stainless steel is uh, stainless steel is that 32.2. The rose gold, which I absolutely love, the rose gold because brown and rose just works together. Dark brown dial with the gold sub dials with the ceramic brown bezel, it just works. It, and that retails at 48.3. I don't know if that watch actually is going to come with an additional strap. I would assume it does. But if it doesn't, I'm fairly certain you can dress it up with just a plain green strap or just a black rubber strap and it will look good just the same. Of course, worst case scenario, you can reach out to Aura Straps and you can pick up one of theirs. Uh, Ladies Offshore. It's a watch that's been doing well and it's been doing well forever. So if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Continue making the ones that you're making. Continue producing the models you produced last year and just come up with one thing that is new. And again, try to charge up for it. 71,000 for a rainbow bezel of a rose gold watch. Is a little bit of a hefty price tag, but in this particular combination, it actually looks great, if you ask me. I think it's a beautiful combination. And even though this is just as rugged as, let's say, in the other Royal Oak, which I mentioned earlier, like the open work, for example, for some reason, I'm, I'm really feeling this combination. Maybe it's because it's the rose dial that blends perfectly in with the rose gold case and the bezel. Maybe it's the fact that this is a computer enhanced picture that I'm looking at. Maybe when I see it in person, I'll think differently. But for me, the rainbow bezel on this on the, on the ladies offshore really, really works. I think the last uh, combination that I felt really, really worked well was my the watch that my wife wears, the, the Lady Alinghi all white with a diamond bezel. And that little red logo is just very, very striking. That's how I feel about the bezel on this particular watch. The focus is indeed on the bezel and it's a good look. Much better look on this offshore than the open work ladies in 37 millimeters. Last but not least, let's talk about everybody, what's in everybody's mind. And I saved the best for last, as they say, the Code 1159 by Audemars Piguet. Hmm. You saw millions of memes out there. Everybody and their mother making fun of this watch. Everybody's saying, this is what you guys came up with after years and years of research as you advertise and so on and so forth. This is what you came up with? Uh, what is my opinion? I give this watch, believe it or not, an A+. What? I give the company an A+, plus for creating this watch. What the fuck? I give the company A+, plus for having the balls to come out of that Royal Oak shell and do something different. Something I've been telling for many brands to, uh, like Panerai, like Jaeger and IWC and all these guys out there that keep making the same thing over and over and over. They don't want to come out of that comfort zone. They don't want to come out of that shell. Look, it's no secret that you know, sporty watches are the winner nowadays in terms of uh, sales. You know, Everybody wants bulkier, sportier chronographs and so on and so forth. All you hear is about, hey, did you see the new Royal Oak Offshore? Hey, did you see the new Nautilus that Patty came out? Hey, did you see the new Rolex that just came out? This is what everybody wants to talk about. AP had the balls, they had the vision to say, you know what, guys? Look, I mean, right now in our lineup, the most popular stuff is the Royal Oak line. The Royal Oak, the Royal Oak Offshore, and, the, and a multitude of variations of everything we just talked about, right? I'm going to do new Royal Oaks, I'm going to do new Offshores, but I also want to do something new, new. I want to do something that we've never done before. And that is indeed the Code 1159. I don't know how much thought process went into the name of Code 1159, and I don't have to read what the website says. You guys can see what all that means. First, I want to talk about the design of the watch. Uh, look at the design. To me, it looks like it's a case within a case, right? You sort of have the main body of the case surrounded by what I would call the bezel, as well as the bottom bezel, and, and the lug system. The way it looks like it feels like the main body of the watch is being held together by sort of this bridge looking construction. For example, in a chronograph where the chrono buttons, uh, the chrono buttons lie, uh, even in a non-chrono, still, you still sort of get that same effect, right? Uh, they talked about the glass, okay? Uh, double curved sapphire crystal. I mean, what's not to love about that? The lacquered dials are a nice touch, both in black and blue. I absolutely love that. No deploying buckle, pin buckle. Arguably, you know, deploying buckles are becoming a thing of the past because they're uncomfortable to the wrist. So they did a pin buckle and the pin buckle 
doesn't look like any other buckle they have ever done. Most times, uh, manufacturers will continue the use of pretty much similar looking buckle. It's nice to see a fresh idea on the buckle, and, and that buckle looks like it actually could belong on a Royal Oak if, on a strap, but nevertheless, A plus on the buckle, just the same. New calibers in the chronograph, new calibers in the automatic, new calibers in all the complications that they made. So as far as the design is concerned, I give them an A plus there. Now let's talk something about something important, uh, pricing, right? Their automatic, I think it's 26,000 and change, and their uh, chronograph is 42 in chains, and it's really irrelevant what the higher complications are, but the prices are very comparable to that of the Jules Audemars line. Now, Edward Piguet was dead in the water, was discontinued. Jules Audemars arguably was also dead in the water. Uh, you find stuff out there for less than half price, right? Whether it's super complicated or even not so complicated, even the chronographs. But AP had a choice to make, and they said, look, we can continue doing what everybody else is doing. We can continue making the hot models and make variations of them for years to come, but that's not us. We have history, we have heritage, we have over 150 years in the business. We're not gonna be the guys to continue making the Royal Oak, because A, we'll kill the Royal Oak that way, and B, we wanna give the clients that love Audemars Piguet truly, not an Audemars Piguet Royal Oak, not an Audemars Piguet Offshore, uh, we wanna, or concept for that matter, we wanna give the guys something else to love. The nuts and bolts is not something that guys out there pay most attention for. So this is made for those guys that appreciate the nuts and bolts. This is made for the guys that appreciate Audemars Piguet, that appreciate its history, and that appreciate something new and a brush of fresh air into the quote unquote the era of the Royal Oak or the Royal Oak Offshore. So for the guys out there that are making fun of this watch, comparing it to Mont Blancs, comparing it to other brands and saying, hey, this looks like any other watch, it really doesn't. Take a closer look to, this, to the design of this watch. Take a closer look at the nuts and bolts of this watch. Take a closer look at the dials. Take a closer look at the complicated the, uh, the complicated pieces they make. The, the Mini Repeater Super Sonnery, that's one of the most complex watches in the world. It takes balls and it takes a long time in the business and a name in the business to be able to create a plain Jane watch. So the Mini Repeater Super Grand Sonnery, I mean, it looks, it looks like a plain Jane watch. It looks like a watch that could cost $5,000, yet I'm, again, it says price upon request. I'm fairly certain it's a watch going to be way over $300,000, if not even more. But uh, based on the history of the Sonneries, I think the cheapest one out there, I think they have for $400,000, so I have to guess this will probably be four fifty plus. And guess what? I heard from a source that there's only going to be a total of 1,500 11, code 1159. So don't be surprised that when you get out there and actually try to buy one, should you want one, that you're gonna have a hard time getting one, either at a discount or getting one at all. If Audemars Piguet decides to go the boutique route, you're gonna be hard pressed to get this watch at a discount period. And again, 1,500 watches is not a lot of watches to begin with, and they won't make 1,500 of them at the same time. You do understand that. Think outside the box for a second, forget the Royal Oak, and take a closer look at the Code 1159. I give that watch an A plus from the nuts and bolts perspective, from a design perspective, for, uh, for, the, for the fact that Audemars Piguet is not afraid to go into the world of quote unquote bulky sports watches today and make something that's still large in size, a 41 millimeter watch, yet it's a dressy watch, and at the same token, it can be a sporty watch should you choose to go, let's say, with a chronograph. And for me personally, you know, when I get out there and I put on a suit once in a blue moon or a tuxedo for a special event, this would probably be the watch I'm going to want to reach for versus a bulky offshore because this wear a lot more comfortable with a suit than it will with an offshore. I know I've been babbling on for a while, so this will be end of part one. I will pick my absolute favorite watch from SIHH from Audemars Piguet. I'll pick one from the Royal Oak Offshore lineup, and that's going to be the blue offshore. I love that combination. Uh, from the Royal Oak selection, I am going to go with the 38 millimeter gray slate dial with the light silver sub dials Royal Oak chronograph. Uh, and from the code 1159, I'm going to go with the badass. I'm going to go with the open work tourbillon. I mean, look at this watch. This, this thing is absolutely stunning and gorgeous. To be honest with you, that watch in a 41 millimeter, I would love to have that on my wrist. I'm sure they'll do different metal variations. And I think once they come out with that watch in platinum, if they do that in platinum and blue, and, and uh, maybe some blued hands or blued bridges, uh, that watch will look absolutely phenomenal. So there you have it, ladies and gentlemen, SIHH, Audemars Piguet. Again, Ian, I guess cut this off here. This will be end of part one, and I'm gonna move on to recording part two.